Welcome to the discussion. My guests today are Paul Smith, General Manager and Senior Vice President, North America Public Sector for Red Hat. Paul, welcome to the program. Thanks, Jason. Good to be here. And Rob Efres, the President of the Coalition for Enterprise Open Source Software for Government. Rob, welcome to the program. Thanks, Jason. Before we get started, let me set some context for our discussion today. This August will be two years since OMB issued its open source policy, promoting the reuse of custom software code and establishing a website to host that code. So far, 26 agencies have posted code for reuse on code.gov. The move to open source goes beyond just a website and the listing of code. The Defense Department earlier this year uh, launched code.mil and has been moving much of its custom developed software code to a central repository to begin managing and licensing its open source methods as well. This 2016 memo was actually the second time OMB tried to promote open source. Uh, Paul probably remembers back in 2004 when, o when then OMB Administrator for E-Government and IT, Karen Evans, issued a memo addressing for agencies the way that agencies buy software. While that memo didn't specifically call it open source, it did remind agencies about how licensing of open source software works. And the Defense Department has tried this approach several times as well, uh, issuing a first policy in 2003, an updated policy in 2009. So here we are 15 years later, despite all these efforts, the focus on o open source, the uptick, I'll call it maybe a little slow. Maybe Paul won't be happy with that uh, uh, idea, but agencies can move toward more open source code and how can they do it? Well, the Trump administration's IT modernization effort maybe is the perfect time for that consideration really more specifically, more broadly to bring in open source. And that's why we have our guests today. Paul Smith, general manager and senior vice president, North American public sector for Red Hat and Rob Efres the president of the Coalition for Enterprise Open Source Software for Government. Uh, Paul, let me start with you. This idea of open source, as I went through, is not new. We've been talking about this for years. But talk about the, the evolution that you've seen around open source software and, and why do you think this is the, the time and the place? Well, to your point, maybe it, in the grand context of things, seems a little slow. Red Hat as a commercial company is now 25 years old, and our humble beginnings were really around Linux, Linux being an operating system that, if you will, at a high level, was an open source project. What we did many years ago, uh, 13 or 14 years ago to be exact, was actually make Linux into something that was consumable at the enterprise level. That is something that was predictable, uh, you could secure it, you could support it. And that's kind of the, the keys to the kingdom. So over time, the evolution has been that we were taking something that was developed in an open source community and making it secure COTS, if you will, commercial off the shelf software, and uh, making it uh, consumable at the, at the high level. And at that level, uh, COTS uh, software, especially Linux, was the one thing that could stay the same so that everything else could be different. You could run Linux on a myriad of different hardware systems from Dell to HP to, um, uh, Sun at the time, and uh, going way back to even Wang and Vax VMS. If Jason, you can remember back to those days. All right, so, now you're trying to date me here, <laughs> and I'll just be honest. Uh, the Wang computer dated was a little bit before my time, but go ahead. So maybe so. So here we've evolved over the years. Where in the in the beginnings of when we started selling this to commercial enterprises, primarily telcos, banks, and governments. It was something that was uh, uh, kind of a project of sorts. So w the difference that we talk about in open source is what happens in communities is where innovation happens. And it happens in communities that are much broader than just Red Hat as a company. Uh, governments participate. Uh, large companies like IBM has been a huge contributor to open source over the years and a lot of individual contributors as well. And what we do is we harness all that innovation and if you will, freeze dry it in a point in time and offer it as a product with version control. And in that way, we can make sure that it works with um, all of your hardware systems, all of your software systems. You know, we, we, uh, we have well over 6,000 ISVs that certify to our software stack. So that's really what an enterprise software company does for a living. And we've seemed to have done it better than most in terms of bringing open source products uh, to the marketplace. Let me bring in Rob for the discussion a little bit. Now, Rob, Paul did a nice job of kind of going through kind of what Red Hat does, but but talk more broadly about what you're seeing in the open source community and as it relates back to the use for, by the government. Sure. The Coalition for Enterprise Open Source Software and Government was formed precisely to address some of the challenges in applying open source software technology to the enterprise. 
um, 10 plus years ago, as you referenced, the adoption rate was just uh, climbing the curve. Now that adoption rate has greatly accelerated to the point where agencies are using open source whenever they can. And in particular, the community versions, also known as free open source, are a very attractive alternative for agencies that are looking to uh, establish projects that address specific agency requirements. The challenge, though, is when those project-related requirements expand into enterprise-related requirements. And our coalition formed with the support of companies like Red Hat and Carasoft and Enterprise DB, Alfresco, Cloudera, Collabnet, MongoDB, and ForgeRock, specifically uh, to, uh, is focused on educating federal IT stakeholders in the executive branch and in the Congress on the differences between free open source software and enterprise open software and how uh, acquiring those uh, involves a similar set of rules that are not always followed by agency purchasers. I know we could go down the path of acquisition quite a bit, but before we go there, let's put a, a better definition of free open source and enterprise open source. And I don't know if Paul or, or Rob, one of you guys wanna jump in here, but but the idea is if, if there's a misconception maybe around what open source is, we all think it's free, anyone can access to it. That's not what you guys are talking about. So maybe Paul. Right, I'll start, Rob, jump in at will. So everything in open source starts off as a project and in, in that regard is free. Open source software has a license uh, associated with it. Most popular of those is the GPL, or the, uh, the GNU public license, or the general public license. And uh, that is a license, much like a proprietary software company would have a license. It, it dictates how it, was, it is to be used. What it doesn't do is, with any certainty, tell you how it's going to act in a production environment with a lot of other moving parts. So what... Enterprise software companies like Red Hat do is we make that enterprise class. And especially in the government, going way back to our roots, we worked in communities such as with the NSA on the uh, version of Linux known as SE Linux or Security Enhanced Linux. That code was actually co-developed upstream, if you will, by both the NSA, uh, the contributors uh, like Red Hat and even IBM at to a level where it was at a stage where we could make it in and turn it into a product. And to this day, some 13 years later, we still dump millions of dollars a year in, into that product to make sure that it, it works well and it can be stigged. It, uh, it, it passes FIPS, PUBS, uh, 140. Uh, we can take those products into FedRAMP, all the heavy lifting that a software company will do that won't happen in the happen in the community. And that's pretty much the definition of taking things from the project phase, which is where innovation happens, which is really cool because a lot of different entities get to participate in making that happen. And then some grown up in the room has to make it uh, to a, uh, to a level that can actually be used in a production environment. Rob, you want to jump in and talk a little bit about this innovation? We've heard Paul bring this up several times already. Why do you get the sense that this this open source can kind of lead that toward that innovation? Uh, because that's all we hear about from CIOs and government these days. Well, the attributes of open source uh, include uh, agile and um, um, uh, open standards, which en enable interoperability. Um, cost savings and the like. And so as agencies frequently adopt an agile uh, development model, um, they're uh, building a little and testing a little rather than going into uh, very, very large programs where there's vendor lock-in and agencies are committed to a systems integrator over a long period of time where requirements change. The innovation comes from the flexibility and the agility of open source software to address uh, the software development lifecycle in an agile way. And, and Paul, are you seeing this idea that the federal customers are, are starting to understand that? It's, it's not just, oh, yeah, open source, I get it, but, oh, here's what I can do, as, as Rob disc has described the idea of DevOps or Agile Iterative Development. Yeah, I think at a high level, if you take a look at the, the whole, uh, what's going on with DevOps as a, as a, as a methodology, as a, as a process, so to speak, it's the, it's the ability to go in, in in small chunks and fail fast or learn fast and iterate 
open source at its very roots is that uh, we've been doing that for for 25 years. You go into uh, you go into a project and you try some things. You you try a patch. You try a new feature, and it goes out and it's either successful or or it's not successful. But it's not a big waterfall that just happens, and it gets test driven in the community. And to the extent that it's actually usable, it actually makes it into the product uh, 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 family. And that's what hap- that's what's happening right now in all of um, uh, t- technology. When development happens, we are doing uh, projects in small iterative cycles. So that paradigm is really playing out right now. And then when you throw on top of that, this thing called the cloud, right? We can never not talk about the cloud. That makes this DevOps this iterative development even easier, where once you had to do it, maybe it was harder to do it in the community environment. Now doing it in the, the cloud creates that community environment. Indeed, and it depends on what you mean by cloud as well. So, right? Cloud, uh, so we can, hybrid cloud, multi, multi cloud, private hybrid cloud, cloud right. private. So, if you take a look at any cloud that's going up on the private side or public side, if you take a look at the big hyper converged clouds right now, uh, providers, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, Azure. Everything in the cloud is open source to some level or degree. There's Linux as the foundation. There's automation tools. There's development tools. Uh, and even this new buzz phrase that everyone's talking about right now, which is basically operating system uh, virtualization, otherwise known as containers, which is basically part of the Linux operating system, all that orchestration was actually developed as a project from Google, uh, also known as Kubernetes. And so here's another thing that's happening in the cloud in terms of how technology is actually uh, being developed and consumed. And Red Hat, as an example, doesn't necessarily have to be the lead in that community, but we are a huge participant in those communities. And as an example with Kubernetes, which is a big part of how we orchestrate workloads in the cloud, we're the number two contributor to that code base in the upstream community, Google being number one. And, uh, and And then the list goes on. So very exciting stuff. Jason, one of the reasons why um, the Office of American Innovation in the White House uh, w- uh, demonstrated a lot of, have demonstrated a lot of support for open source technology is in regard to the cloud and the emphasis on the migration of legacy applications to the cloud and the requirements uh, on agencies to uh, 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 use more digital related technology to improve service to the citizens. And this puts pressure on agencies to come up in a a quick turnaround way with applications, uh, many relying on open source or built on open source technology that can address not only the legacy migration, but the shift to digital. And Rob, I think you bring up a really key point here because of the push from the IT modernization. I think we'll get more, probably more into it a little bit later in the program. Do you see, uh, and maybe this is a better question for Paul, do you see more Red Hat customers from the, in the federal market asking, okay, well, how do I do this differently like what's been what have you seen maybe the last you know six to eight to 12 months from your customers so the the big pushes right now is how do we go digital how do we modernize uh, our existing applications and how do we go cloud native for our new applications and all is that all of that is really driven around open source is driven around platforms as a service where the developer is now the king uh, developers rule the world as, as they haven't really for a long time but now we're providing a platform where they can actually get down and code uh almost immediately without having to worry about uh provisioning vms or finding hardware and going through all of the other processes of getting up and and writing code in a very fast manner and i've heard that before that it used to be everything was based on hardware where okay can we have the box we have room on the box how do we buy the box now we don't have to worry about that anymore. Agencies now can say, I already have it, all I need. And if I need more, I can just call my cloud provider and say, turn it up a little bit. Is that the big change that you've seen and why open source and open standards and, and this open architecture discussion is is really gaining some steam? I think so. I mean, if you look at Google Compute, um, if you look at Google Compute, if you take a look at uh, Azure as they're developing their uh, their platform, if you take a look at Amazon, they are delivering delivering infrastructure as a service. I can just go, I can spin up a spin up a machine, and I can do my development. And now customers are actually bringing that on prem as well with the same type of constructs, with the same type of architecture. And the real challenge now is how do I do both? Because there's a lot of applications and a lot of workloads that have to live in both places. It can live in uh, a a public cloud for certain workloads that they need to burst to or 
it needs to be back on campus, so to speak, because it needs to be secured. They need to have control of not only the application but of the data. So what we do at a high level is we abstract all of that such that the workloads or the containers, if you will, can move from on-prem to the cloud without having to be refactored. So portability at that level will provide a lot of agility and also provide protection from lock-in because at that level, now all you're doing is just asking either your internal IT staff or Microsoft or Google or Amazon for an SLA. And to the extent that they deliver, great, stay there. And to the extent that uh, someone else provides uh, a little bit of a hop skip over that and they have a better uh, functionality, you can move there. So you can't get locked in for the long term. All right, that's a good point. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we can jump into some IT modernization. You're listening to the discussion Innovation in Government, sponsored by Kerasoft on federalnewsradio.com and 1500 AM. 